what a lot of people have is the idea that they're living a fully conscious life, but they're not really. So you get to learn how you can change the way you respond to difficult things. Welcome to the Body Minds Empowerment Podcast episode four. We're starting to gain momentum, I can feel it. We're gonna keep pumping out more content, keep spreading the message, the value, the knowledge of becoming self-empowered and enhancing human life. The last episode was about my adventures at the Biohacker Summit in Helsinki. First of all, take two of this. Yeah. yeah. And this one is gonna be a more in-depth conversation with one of the speakers from the event, Kasper van der Mullen. The ability to focus will be the superpower of the 21st century. And the little thing I did with you right at the beginning, that is the main skill that I've been building ever since I was 16 of looking inside, asking what is there, why is it there, where did it come from, how did I get here, and how do I change this state? And it all starts with the ability to focus. He's the owner of MindLift, which is a training system and company that teaches people to control their nervous system and physiology. Kasper is from the Netherlands and he's also studied under Wim Hof himself, so he's definitely cold adapted and body, mind empowered. If you want to support this podcast, then leave us a review on iTunes, Stitcher and follow Seamland on social media. I'm gonna take your feedback, learn from my mistakes, keep making improvements and soon enough, we're gonna get this thing out there. Another way to support this podcast is to get one of those Stay Empowered t-shirts that I'm wearing. What it stands for is showing up for the greatest version of yourself and earning your laurels every day. But without further ado, let's get on with today's episode with Kasper van der Mullen. Do you want to know what it is? Body, mind, empowerment. Get stronger, faster, smarter quicker, friendlier, more helpful, more driven. Everything the body needs. Control your mind. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and uh, what do you do? Yeah, so um, I'm from the Netherlands. That's where I'm from and uh, that's where I was born and raised. And now I am in Helsinki to talk about the nervous system and about how to hack it, about breathing uh, and about all kinds of different cool ways that you can optimize your life quality. And that's what most of my work is about. So from my own book, I talk a lot about focus, I talk a lot about cognitive enhancement, um, hacking the nervous system, and then I also work together with a lot of different people uh, to yeah, get, get to the cutting edge, the forefront of these new techniques. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've been doing here is like guiding people into the ice baths with the Wim Hof method, also a lot of fun. Different breathing techniques, and especially out here, it's just crazy stuff all along. Good conversations and all these cool things to try, so having a good time. Breathe out, let it go. Shake it up. Okay, everybody feeling good? Awesome. What is the key ingredient to this, uh, the, the mind of training systems? The key ingredient is taking full responsibility for your own life. Mm. That's uh, like the fundamental underlying thing that is so important for all the work we do. So in all the biohacking, all the self-improvement, all the health stuff, you can't actually use it if you don't understand, have a deeper underlying understanding that everything in your life is your responsibility. Well, that's where it all starts. And everywhere I go all over the world, I meet people who are ready to take that responsibility, but they don't really know how. So they've got, their, they've got the why. They know, okay, this is why I wanna do it. They see that there's all these different methods and different ways to do it on the level of what, and then they want a how to go from why to what. So they want, they're looking for a way to really put these things into their life. And that's what I try to, uh, kind of like the vacuum I try to fill in with my work is to give people a very practical, scientific understanding, simple techniques, uh, but all in their own responsibility. I can't help anybody, I can't fix anybody, but I can maybe teach them a tool that they can help themselves. Yeah, so what, what does the technique actually look like? What's the practice of it? There's different, there's so many different things. So what I've done with MindLift specifically is develop a program that allows people to, in, to pick one thing and to integrate that in their lives. So we have a, um, a method for self-experimentation. It's like a, an entry level uh, way to learn biohacking. So they determine where am I, where do I want to go, what's my best tool, and how do I really integrate it into my life for the long term. That's something that I do with MindLift a lot. 
um, and the book has been out for quite a while. And now I'm starting to look into different methods where I teach people to change the state of their nervous system. And I don't really have a set method for that yet. I'm experimenting kind of. Also here, like if people ask me a question and I guide them through something, then I'm experimenting on them, basically. Um, and to have the question of what is the state that I'm in? What is the state where I want to go and how do I get there? And one of the things we use, for example, is, uh, well, the, the ice bath is a very strong trigger. And people go into the ice bath uh, and they, they feel the shock in their system. And then they notice that they respond in a certain way. And then if you can watch your own response, you can also change your response. Mm -hmm. So we work outside of the comfort zone, actually, a lot. Yeah. And can you explain for some people who don't actually have much knowledge about these uh, topics, like how does how does your how does the state of your physiology affect your nervous system, and you know, vice versa? How is it connected? So, very basically, you have to understand that uh, your brain and your nervous system always work together. And there's two things they do: they process input, so they gather information from the outside world, and then they turn that into an output. Right? So, and the output can be. Uh, your behavior, your actions, the things that you do, the way that you feel, and the input is anything you know you eat, anything you see. Also, thoughts can be input. So, what a lot of people have is the idea that they're living a fully conscious life, but they're not really. So, a lot of our life happens unconscious, subconscious. Only four percent of everything you do and think and feel and and get into your system is actually um, completely conscious. Mm -hmm. And at least 96% is subconscious. So what happens here is that a lot of people, they find themselves in a certain state and they go, oh, now I'm suddenly I'm eating junk food or suddenly I'm mad or suddenly I'm sad or suddenly I'm being mean to somebody. And they think uh, they don't know where it's from. Yeah. So it feels like it's happening to them. Mm -hmm. A lot of people feel that life is happening to them instead of that they're doing it. So, if you can start to understand your nervous system, then instead of just watching yourself be in a certain state, mentally or emotionally, you can also go, so okay, so how did I get to this state? What are the physiological systems that are there? So, your nutrition, for example, or the way that you breathe, the way that you think, but also the way that you move and the way you hold your posture, all of those things matter and all of those things add to the state that you're in. What's important to understand here is that the priority to go into fight flight when you see the lion, the risk of not doing that is death. But the importance of going out of fight flight when the lion is gone, there's not too much risk involved because he's already gone. So that's why our physiology is much better at going boom into fight flight and staying there for a long time. So the main takeaway there is Yes, we have these mental states. We find ourselves in a certain circumstance where, oh, now suddenly I feel this, I think that. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. And the physiology is what's below the water. Yeah. And what I, like, what I try to teach people is how they can get more and more of that giant iceberg that they can't see or feel right away to get that into their awareness. Why smoking? Why do I keep doing this? And it's because the only thing we feel is that last giant domino falling. You go, boom, you make that face and you go, shit, I'm there again. What would be like the biggest reasons why people get stuck in that, uh, they, that they see only the surface? What? That's a great question. I think um, modern life uh, asks a lot from us. Mm. There's a lot of different stimuli, input all over the place. Uh, the world is changing very fast. Mm -hmm. And if there's so much input, so much different opinions, so much news and information and everything, it's really difficult to feel that you can influence your life. Yeah. So people assume that they can't, simply because it's so difficult and they don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So if you consider, for example, now in the modern world, compared to primitive life, in primitive life you live in a tribe yeah. and all you need to be aware of is the weather, uh, the predators, the state of the plants, and how the hundred people around you are feeling and doing. Mm -hmm. It's pretty manageable. Yeah. Now in the modern world, you can like go on your phone at any moment of the day, you can learn about, you know, polar bears dying because of the chemicals that they use in China to make the iPhones that are in our pockets, but they're designed in California. It's all over the... The world is one big place. And in such a big world, people feel like they don't have influence on the world. And they assume they don't have influence on their life. Mm -hmm. So I try to teach people to 
look very, like, start with the smallest, tiniest thing within that you can control. Mm -hmm. What's the one thing that you can control? And the main thing you always can control is your reaction to these circumstances. So that's one thing. The modern world is a very difficult place to really be in control of. And then you have, um, there's actually no systems that teach us how to do it. The education system, you still have to sit down and be quiet and you know, listen to the teacher and get a job. And they're training people for a world that don't, lo no longer exists. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the modern world is bad for us and we can't thrive in it. It's that we haven't learned how to do it. And all of those things fit into the same basic human physiology. So it's like you have a source and you have all these different streams. And what I find very important is to teach people that the source is where the truth is and the stream. So a lot of people, they find a new stream and they go, oh, this is the source. And then they find something new and they go, oh, no, that must be the source. But they're all streams from the same source. What would be like some easy practical tips for people to implement to bring more awareness around these things and how to take control over their physiology? That's a great question. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, the, one, of the, one of the strongest ways to increase your awareness is to write a journal, write a diary, and just start with writing down simple things that you are proud of in a day or that you're grateful for. Mm -hmm. Gratitude diary is very powerful. Because uh, then you actually get to see the ideas in your head on paper. And it's important to do it with a pen. Because if you're always on your screen, you're not really get it, giving your fingers the option to move and to process data through your body. Mm -hmm. So drawing, writing is a very powerful thing. So writing a journal is a tip I give to everybody. Mm -hmm. Another one is to meditate in any way, shape or form. And a lot of people think like, yeah, but how? And which one, there's so many different meditations, who cares? Just pick a meditation, go on YouTube, do like five minute guided meditation, <laughs> listen to it and start. That's the thing, people don't really start. They think, they think, oh, I need the best meditation teacher, or I need to go to India. No, you have YouTube, go online, do it. You know, this is why people are watching this in the first place. YouTube is a powerful medium. You can learn anything in the world, so go. So diary, meditation, uh, cold shower. This is very great because I always advise, and also I've learned this in the Wim Hof Method, it's such a great tool to learn about yourself. So the best place to learn about yourself is just outside of the comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So you take your warm shower, and at the end of your warm shower, you turn the hot water off, you turn the cold water on, and you, you stay under the cold until you're relaxed. Mm -hmm. And what that teaches you is, you get to watch yourself how you respond to something that is difficult and scary. So you get to learn how you can change the way you respond to difficult things. Mm -hmm. So then you have, you know, you have the, well, let's keep it at those three. You write the diary to get your own ideas out of your head and to really see what's going on within you. Mm -hmm. You meditate, so you increase your awareness, your ability to concentrate, awareness in your body. And then cold shower is just a great way to trigger yourself. It's, it has a lot of physiological benefits, your circulation, your breathing, your fat burning, everything improves but especially that you get to watch yourself as you do something different. And if you watch yourself often enough, you can also change the way you react to it. Mm -hmm. And to, that's where the, that's like, for me, where it all started. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, what about the cold showers though? Like the, some people who say like they, they try to start taking some cold showers in the morning, but they can't, you know, whether, whether that's because of fear yeah. or because of, you know, their body simply can't, isn't able to handle those things. What, what, what would you say to those people who where to start? Yeah, so it's, um, it's more fear than it is danger. Mm -hmm. the, the cold shower is not in the danger zone, mm -hmm. but it is outside of the comfort zone. Actually, if you, like people, if you can do, uh, like if you can sit in a sauna, if you can do a workout and get out of breath for 40 minutes, like if you can run 5K, that's actually more intense for the body than a cold shower. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have like a 10 minute warm shower, and then at the end, you have like a one minute cold shower. Mm -hmm. It's not that impressive for the body. But, so there's much, so, but there is fear. People are scared of it. So there's more fear than danger. So what you get to do there is go, okay, I have this voice inside of me that tells me that this is a bad idea, that it's dangerous, but maybe that voice isn't always right. Mm -hmm. And if you can then kind of like watch that voice protest, but do it anyway, then you're training the mental muscle of going into the difficult thing, even though you're scared. 
Mm. And it doesn't mean you have to train yourself to do dangerous things, that's way on the other end of the spectrum. But if you just start there, a lot of people find that life becomes easier because they start the day with something difficult. So in the morning they go, no, you know what, I'm making this decision for myself, I'm not letting fear control me, I'm doing it. Then when they're in their job and they have to do a difficult conversation with their boss or something, and they want to, they want to shy away from it, then they, they can go, you know what, I'm scared, but I'll probably be able to manage, and they do it. Mm -hmm. So it trains this mental muscle um, that has all these different benefits that you can use in life. Yeah, and when uh, we're talking about fear, is it is it like actually like more of a physiological response, or is it uh, like a psychological barrier or something like that? Ah, it's both. Oh. And that's, that's a cool thing because fear is also physiology. Mm. The part of your brain that makes fear is in charge of a lot of the hormonal systems in your body. Mm. So fear is not just something that is in between your ears or in your head, it's also something in your nervous system. It's something in your hormonal system. Mm. So if, if the brain gets a danger signal, it makes you know adrenaline and cortisol, it flushes the body with it, and you just respond according to those chemicals. So it is physiology. And people have been, a lot of people believe that you have the mind and the body, mm. which causes a disconnection. And if you have a disconnection, then you feel like, yeah, I have this mind somewhere up here, and then I have this body somewhere down there. And this one is trying to be in charge, and that one won't listen. But if you practice this way, and you understand that, hey, there's actually a physiology of fear. I have parts of my brain that do it. And you can actually be grateful for it, because it's a helpful system. You have adrenaline, you have cortisol, which are, it's like doping in your own body. It's great. So then these practices, they help kind of lift the border between mind and body. And from there, you can really start to find trust in that, you're, that there's deep wisdom in the body. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's millions of years of evolution that we're walking around with. Mm -hmm. And now with this relatively new thinking mind that has only been around for a while, for like 100,000 years, which is nothing. And we've gotten this mistrust to our own body, to our own physiology. So when we say biohacking, it often sounds like we need to add all kinds of things to our body or use technology to replace something. No, it's more about getting back to the original connection. Is it something to be overcome or is it something to be, you know, something to be readapted into your uh, modern life? Yeah, absolutely. It's about alignment. It's okay. about finding the combination. Okay. Um, I'm not a big fan of like conquering goals or overcoming this or breaking down that. It's To me, it's very much about integrating it. Mm. You don't have to go live in, in you know, in a, in a cabin up north uh, without electricity, you know, to be healthy. Absolutely not. But mm -hmm. you need, do need to make a conscious effort to integrate those things in your life because it's not automatic. If you just do what life asks you of you and what society asks of you, go to school, you know, wear your coat in the winter and never go outside or you get a cold, you know, get a job and do everything we say. It's all these things that are not necessarily true. So it's about making a conscious effort of getting in touch with nature. And when I say nature, people think, you know, trees and plants outside, but you also have nature within you because you are a part of nature. Uh, and, and to really start to feel that. And if you do a cold shower, you can feel it. If you start to forage your own food, you can start to realize that you are one with your environment. If you go outside in the rain or wherever and you um, make sure you have, for example, uh, you know, you just feel the cold, wear a, a, one layer less, you know. Mm -hmm. Go and, and breathe in some fresh air, go and climb a tree or roll in the mud, that kind of thing. Like a kid, have fun again. Yeah. That's the type of simple ways that we really need to go outside or just getting sunlight in your eyes, especially if you live in, in Scandinavia, you know, yeah. it's, if you spend your winters inside, you have a lot of trouble with your own nature. So if you want to start hacking the nervous system, what we need to do is we need to raise our awareness and awareness is like the reason I made this box black actually is because in scientific terms, we talk about a black box. So there's an input, into the human, something happens to us, and then all kinds of stuff happens in the dark, we have no idea, and then we respond. So enlightenment, increasing awareness, is a process of creating a tiny little light inside your own black box, learning to look within, learning to read your heart rate, your breath rate, your temperature, all of that, which by the way, we've got all these cool trackers like the Aura that can do it for you, can help you to relearn it, but I teach people to do it from the inside. 
And then you can actually choose your response. Now, if you're into positive psychology, you know, Viktor Frankl, he has a quote that says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space lies our choice. And in that choice lies our freedom. And that's where we begin. So a lot of biohackers and people want to change the world. We're all on a mission to make something greater. But start in the tiniest little, tiniest little space you can actually control, which is the space between a stimulus and a response. What do you do in your personal daily routine to get in touch with nature and you know, incorporate these techniques of your own? Um, many different things. Like the first thing I do in the morning is I go outside uh, on my bare feet and I stand with my feet in the grass like to feel grounded mm. and I just stand there I breathe in the fresh air and I make sure my eyes are open to get daylight in not necessarily sunlight you can't stare into the sun anyway but just daylight into your eyes the first mm. thing in the morning and that tells your biorhythm like hey it's time to go if you stay inside with artificial lights or with your screen or whatever the body doesn't get the trigger of hey it's daytime it's time to go yeah. and I just stand there and I feel the cold grass in my feet I feel like I'm grounding, I've got the light coming in, and then slowly I try to listen to, usually the birds are already awake, and I try to listen to uh, all the nature around me. And I live in the city, so I have to make an effort to realize that there's nature. So I'm standing in my own yard, and then I'm like, okay, so actually, oh, there's a bird here, and it's talking to that bird, and you know, it, and there's this tree that's waving in the wind, and the weather is changing, and there's, there's wind going beside my skin, and I feel it, right? So, there is always nature everywhere, but you just have to take the time to be aware, to stand there and go, where is it, how do I feel it, and how does it influence me? And that's just my morning ritual. It's yeah. just 10 minutes. It's yeah. very simple. And what, what would be like something that would stop people from doing it? Is it? I literally have people saying, like, what will my neighbors think when I go out <laughs> on my bare feet? Who's this weird guy? Uh... Yeah. It's like, what, what will they think about me if I just stand outside doing nothing? Well, I hope they think that you're just a happy person enjoying life, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's social constrictions, yeah, exactly, mainly. Exactly, exactly. It's mainly that people are afraid, what will other people think? Or people say, I don't have the time, right? They don't have the time to stand outside and enjoy life for 10 minutes, you know, actively enjoy life for 10 minutes. If you don't have 10 minutes in your day to stand outside and enjoy life, what's the point of life? You know, why would you even go on living? I'm like, come on, you have to make the effort and, and really uh, go for it. So it's generally those kinds of things. What will other people think? You know, I don't have time, I have to get up earlier. And it's, it's all just, yeah, it's excuses. And it's, you know, I have those, I, I have them sometimes, but the excuses are not the boss. There's, there's nothing wrong with having that voice in your head that says like, this is stupid or you shouldn't do that. It's just a question of to which voice do you listen, right? Yeah. It's, is it the one that of the programming, of the parenting, of the schooling, of whatever, or is it the one that re that's really in your heart? We have this area in between. We know that if you breathe through the nose into the diaphragm, we've got a ton of data right here, so please, um, but I'll keep it simple. Breathe into the nose, into the diaphragm, simulates your parasympathetic system. Right? This is your optimal breathing muscle, so you need to learn how to use it. There's all this space that you can occupy. If you breathe in active and breathe out calmly, you're stimulating the vagus nerve. So a little protocol we did yesterday, box breathing, is a way to tell your nervous system, be calm, but be focused. Just focus on your own body. You also like the Wim Hof instructor, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what was that type of training and how, how, what did you learn most about in there? Yeah, so the Wim Hof method is a very powerful method and I've been, I, I spent a year training with Wim Hof and now I also teach the other instructors. Mm -hmm. What I learned there is, to, um, it's funny because a lot of people say like, yeah, it's about the breathing and it's about the cold and it's about, you know, getting stronger and conquering your things. And, but what it really taught me is how to feel mm -hmm. what is going on inside my body. So this disconnection that we spoke about, the main disconnection people have is the, kicks, the connection between their thoughts and their emotions. And a lot of people, they have so many thoughts the whole time that you can't really feel what's going on in your body. Mm. If you look at something like burnout, one in, I think, eight people, I might have the statistic wrong, but I think it's one in eight people in the modern world get a burnout. 
And then if you look at the core of what that is, is that they were ignoring all of their internal signals the whole time. Mm. Now, if you step into an ice bath, or you're swimming in an ice cold lake, or you're climbing like a, co a frozen mountain in your shorts, you really have to feel everything that is there, mm. because the body is sending all these signals about what's going on. If you then, if you're in the cold and you're thinking about your to-do list, or you're thinking about your email, or about your boss, you're shivering within a second. So the cold is like an ultimate feedback loop. Mm -hmm. And the feedback loop keeps you present with your emotions. And if you can be present with your emotions, you're not scared of your own emotions. Uh, you're not afraid to feel what you feel. It gives you a lot of freedom. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people, have the main fear they have is not that there's actual danger, but they're afraid to feel something they don't want to feel. And then if you train in the cold with feeling something that you don't want to feel, like the cold, <laughs> it's no fun. <laughs> it's fun. But you at least train the mental muscle of really looking inside and being aware of what's there. Mm. And uh, what is your personal maybe technique for accepting the cold? Or what, how do you feel the cold? Some sort of technique? breathing is uh, is very important. So. Um, your body wants to really breathe heavy and go <gasps> like that if you go into the cold. But that's not really helpful. So uh, one of the best ways to uh, deal with it is to calm down your breathing. And then at the point where you can breathe very slowly, that's when the body also is no longer in stress. And if you're no longer in the stress panic mode, then you can actually have time to feel what is there. Mm. And there's a lot of different like mindfulness tech meditation techniques where you learn how to watch an emotion or a feeling happen without needing to change it. But there's no, like, we label emotions or feelings as negative, and then we say, I don't want to feel it. But if you take away the labels, it's just there. And then oh, there's the physiological aspect. If you do the Wim Hof method breathing technique, that actually allows you to change your pH level and make you feel the cold without feeling pain. Mm. So cold and pain are not the same. But if you just go into the cold, they feel the same. Mm. And pain is a signal for danger. So that's why you have more fear. Mm. So if you use the Wim Hof method breathing, you can change the way your body chemically responds to pain. And then it's actually easier to just feel the cold. You go like, I'm cold and I'm fine. Some final tips for people to, how, how could they become more aware of these things? I start small. start small. It's the main thing. You start small, like a daily cold shower. It's very safe. It's actually easy, and within a week, people start to enjoy it. Mm. Or, for example, um, the the thing going out on your bare feet in, into the your grass or your lawn or whatever, or even on the street for a minute or five minutes. Your feet are very intelligent, right? And if you if you do it. The feet are very sensitive for the first time, and there's some pain, and there's some discomfort, and you know, and then you have to work with it. And then there's two options: you go, "Oh, I can't do it," and you go back inside, or you go, "Okay, let's just feel what's here. I'm probably fine. I'll be back inside in three minutes." So it's very much about trust. So the main thing is get a little micro version of the big scary thing, and just start working with the smallest, tiniest little version of the mental muscle you want to train. Mm How -hmm. was Win Hope as a teacher for you? <laughs> he was a lot of fun. He was fun. <laughs> yeah, he's a very interesting uh, person and he had, he's had a very, very interesting life with all kinds of things going on. And he is a kind of mystical teacher where I'm the kind of teacher who explains everything uh, scientifically and then I allow people to feel that. And he's the kind of teacher that puts you in a situation where you just have to feel it and there's no way out. He just goes like, this is what you need to learn and he's very... Um, good at sensing what those different things are. So for me in my life, that was very powerful. I haven't had a lot of people that I studied with. He was actually, there's maybe two or three people that I've studied with and he's one of them because it's such a completely different way of teaching than anybody else. Yeah. So it was exactly what I needed because now I do a lot of explain explaining because you know, I'm a science teacher and I like it, but you can also get stuck in wanting to explain everything. Mm. And what I learned from him is to go, stop explaining, stop talking, stop bullshitting, feel it, do it, trust, and go for it. Mm. Um, so it's given me a massive sense of trust from working with him. Okay, and that, and that is something that you're, you know, incorporating into your own tuning system as well. Yes. Okay. And where can people find more information about that? Oh, they can find me on mindlift.com, mm -hmm. and uh, my uh, Instagram tag is uh, and YouTube is at Casper's Focus. K-A-S-P-E-R-F-O-C-U-S. I think I got that right. 
Um, yeah, and if anybody watches this and they enjoy, um, they enjoy it, just drop me a message. I always love hearing back from people. That is it for today's podcast, and I definitely encourage you to start practicing controlling your nervous system, whether that be through breathing exercises, cold showers, ice baths, or even some winter swimming. I know I'm definitely going to start planning to go for these regular winter swims throughout the entire winter. It's gonna really boost my immune system and bioenergetics production. But definitely leave us a review on iTunes if you haven't already. Give us some feedback in the comment section below. My name is Seem. I wish you well. Stay empowered.